And um, so, immediately to the messy world of participation, and um, you know, whoever said uh, uh, the truth is never pure and uh, rarely simple, or whichever way around it is, I think exactly the same can be said uh, about um, participation and um, achieving measures of participation. And um, you know, the clue to the kinds of things I'm going to talk about in, in the second part of my title, I'm saying it's about um, negotiating um, community connections and collaborations in, in health research. So I, I want to kind of explore, without coming up with any magic bullets, perfect answers, um, what can enable participative research in, in health research and um, to, to touch on a number of areas in, in, in so doing. So to um, think about whether having a policy, for instance, of, of, of public and patient involvement, um, can that ensure participation in health research? Um, what about understanding um, you know, the potential of, of participation? Does that en enable it? Uh, what about scoping the potential for specific participation in, in any given instance? And uh, you know, what about enabling and negotiating participation? And, and I want to unpick um, three examples of, of uh, research in which I've been involved, um, in which there are both sort of challenges and also um, potential for participation, which, which emerged over the... the, the um, uh <coughs> longish processes of research entailed in each one. So the first is um, a chronic fatigue syndrome, um, ME, research observatory, which is a project, a programme, which was uh, lottery fund, big lottery funded, and um, which went on for um, a, a number of years. Um, then um, a, a five-year long-term evaluation of a joint agency prostitution strategy following the murders in um, Ipswich, and then um, an action research project to improve post-operative education to prepare patients and families for colorectal surgery. So all of them offering both um, challenges and, and potential for participation. So... Um, that there is a line now, officially, on what public involvement in, in, in health research looks like, and um, a, an organisation uh, within uh, the NHS which explicitly supports and promotes um, public involvement in, in health research. And it's called Involve, and it defines um, public involvement in research as research being carried out with or by members of the public rather than to, about or for them. So th th there is something there about taking particular roles and having a particular relationship to the research process. And um, in indicative ways might be, for instance, working with funders on establishing research priorities to be funded in the first place, um, perhaps advising as project steering group members, perhaps collaborating on the research materials or research processes or taking up co-researcher roles. So, th so those are the kinds of things that, 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 that people expect now. And there is great encouragement for um, PPI in health research. Um, firstly, uh, to actually ensure that the research itself is relevant, um, that it can actually be carried out, um, that it's acceptable both in terms of how it's being carried out and also in what it produces, and that it's accessible. That it's that's something that's increasingly expected by the public, and I think increasingly a notion that something that is publicly funded, like research that's meant to work for the public, should in some way be accountable to a wider public and make itself so in, in, in various ways. And so that's also supported nationally by a whole range of groups, not only involve, but the major patient condition relevant groups often themselves have patient panels and um, key stakeholder groups who actually help determine their agendas, their priorities, and encourage awareness of the best ways to engage their constituent groups of people. And those are, that's now supported locally, very often, 
by um, PPI development groups. So those are groups of people coming together to train members of the public to be volunteer participants in actually engaging in research in this way. But <laughs> I suppose I would get around to saying this quite quickly. Just because you've got a, a, a policy um, does not mean to say that you've necessarily got an environment which lends itself to participation. And there are a number of inbuilt features of what is common in health research that raise challenges. So one of them is that um, there is a high degree of regulation in um, health and related agency organisations and settings. The way in which those organisations run, of necessity, require regulation. There isn't a day goes by, in fact, today is yet another day where um, problems of regulation clearly impose pressures on the organisation to be regulated. That does not necessarily lend itself to free and flexible involvement of various people and outsiders in, in those organisations. Um, and those requirements are externally regulated. Governance is regulated, ethics is regulated, and it applies both to the organisation of the services and to any research that's conducted in that area. So that degree of regulation um, ha has a number of, of uh, um, features that anyone trying to do participative research actually runs up against as, as uh, perverse barriers, if you like. And the nature of health research itself. Um, the commonest and gold standard type of research design is the randomised controlled trial. And that's about evidencing the effectiveness of what it is that uh, how services run, how medications, the effects of medications, the effects of treatment. It is really important that that is the case. However, by its name, they are controlled, they are standardised, and therefore not necessarily um, welcoming of flexibility as you go along, improvisation and um, taking into account what might stand outside the norm. And even the gathering of um, evidence, systematic reviews of the usual approved way of doing that, if that's to underpin uh, both research and the regulation of services. So we have the body of the National Institute of, uh, for Clinical Excellence, which um, regulates what it is that can be prescribed as, as interventions and medications in, um, in, in the health services. It has to be referred to. They rely on a diet of systematic reviews, which are also highly controlled and standardised. Right? So this is a degree of control and regulation, which means, which poses all sorts of problems, both for action and understanding, for people to come into that. Now, I'm very interested in words like embedding, you know, how, how you actually um, get something that might otherwise be rejected into a potentially unfriendly, unwelcoming um, environment. Um, I, I should say I, I, I trained initially as a social anthropologist and uh, then as an ethnographic um, sociologist. These do not sit comfortably <laughs> With, with, with those sorts of designs. And yes, I have done research capacity development with health professionals nearly all my lecturing life. So I am well used <laughs> to the kinds of, of uh, um, issues and misunderstandings and disagreements that can happen when one tries to go about doing um, embedding introduction and um, have conversations across um, different different divides. And I suppose where my ethnographic experience has proved very useful to me, apart from learning to be very, very humble about my research uh, skills and how much anybody will be impressed by them ever in the world in which I live in, in, in health research, is to be reminded that participation is not an abstract standardised set of regulations. It does not fit into a ready-made uh, protocol, but it's actually a process. And um, that every project, I always think of every project as being like its own little world. It's a little world that you have to make. You have to translate it from a piece of paper 
And then things have to happen to real people in real lives in the world and somehow we have to collaborate. And over the life of the project, you have to live in that real world and make it something worthwhile that works. So with resources and processes and its own relationships. And participation, if it's going to work, is a process which has to draw on the specifics of that little world that is created. So these are three little worlds that I'm going to, that I'm going to refer to and then think about what this can mean for embedding participation in, in those three examples. And I'm going to think about what roles there can be for participation and then the, the kinds of dynamics um, that can be set up. And I'm going to think about, if we take in turn, so who, who are the research partners? And if we think about that, of the research partners, who is then able to shape the research aims, the research topics? And what, what processes and structures will enable participation through the research partners? In terms of the research design that gets set up, what aspects of the research design will actually support dialogue and sharing decisions because that's going to be part of how participation happens. Once the research is underway, the data collection, are there aspects of the data collection that enables, for instance, co-researching in some way? So for people to actually share in the production of research. And what kinds of data might in themselves inform um, participative processes? And then having, having collected one's data, you have to, got to have to make something of it. And is the something of it that one makes something that will actually bring on board the people who need to participate in its use and um, in its further, um, further development? So what sort of data analysis in this project might, sh uh, might enable shared interpretation, shared validation of what's coming out of the research? Um, and then finally, with the outputs, the dissemination strategy, so how's this stuff getting out to the wider world? Who's it going to be accessible to? And who shares in doing that dissemination? Um, who's, who's taking part in the development and delivery of those outputs? So I'm going to start with um, one very interesting but very challenging uh, programme. And this, this was one which is uh, part of uh, the CFSME Observatory for Socially Inclusive Epidemiological and Social Research. And this was a programme of the research that was, that was commissioned um, by um, Action for ME. So this was a, a, a national organisation working closely with, and I can't say the CFSME community, there is not the, because it's a highly contested area where there are very, very different stances. So I will say some of the CFSME um, communities. And this is a big collaboration um, with uh, four universities collaborating with um, uh, Action for ME and then uh, a whole range of, of associated and networked groups. So th the, the, the challenges initially came in, in the condition itself because chronic fatigue syndrome is long term, it's fluctuating, it's very poorly recognised by health, social social, uh, health and social care professionals and public. And it has very diverse symptoms. Um, so those include neurological, um, gastrointestinal, cardiovascular, muscular pain and physical and mental fatigue. Now people, so, so the, the kind of dismissive might say, oh yes, yuppie flu, and uh, you know, difficult to distinguish from, from any form of fatigue. It is far more than that. And 25% of, of cases that are confirmed, and, and the confirmed bit is quite important, are markedly disabled, very markedly disabled, housebound or be bedridden. And, and most people with confirmed CFSME have, have quite adverse effects on the way in which they function. And so, um, the research collaboration that was set up around the idea of a national observatory with the CFSME community was, was aimed at developing um, a disease register where people with confirmed CFSME would put themselves forward to be available for research with a whole range of their characteristics recorded 
and, um, and then we also carried out five research studies which included everything from disease prevalence and to various forms of impact on the experiences of life and care of people with CFSME. And in, in what ways was it possibly a participative collaboration? Well, first of all, it was led and sponsored, and the whole programme was monitored and reviewed, and we were accountable to Action for ME. It had an inclusive steering group, and it had inclusive, and it had a, um, a patient-only reference group. Um, and we also held regular consensus events of different sorts, um, drawn from the CFSME community. And what that meant was if, you, if one's organising events like that, is to be very careful about the, the place, the organisation, the timing, the planning, the lighting, um, the, the, the ways in which there were quiet rooms, not quiet rooms, um, facilitated conversation. So to actually get the inclusion happening in those consensus events needed to take account. We had to draw on the knowledge that people had within that network to advise us how to make those consensus events meaningful. And um, working with Action for ME and the community members informed all of the research, the organisation of the research and the steering processes that were overseeing it. And the dissemination of uh, what was produced, um, I think we had sev sev seven articles, se at least seven articles in the end, that went to open access academic journals and also a whole range of, of uh, findings via the Action for ME website. And one of, the, one, one of the studies was a systematic review of research. And we organised it so that it was on express needs, because what we wanted to, to, to ensure was that um, even though we were using something like systematic review methods, it would be focused on enhancing the voice of people with CFSME who may not have otherwise um, been listened to or heard in terms of determining it. So one of our search criteria um, was that this would be looking at research needs directly expressed by people living with ME. And what that did, that really underlined the importance of um, their, it, people being able to make sense of symptoms, getting a diagnosis, understanding service providers and having understanding service providers, and also being able to access real information as opposed to myths, um, stigmatising labels, um, you know, misleading, um, quack-like information, um, especially for strategies about how to access work, education and relationships. And this was then um, borne out across a number of studies. One of them I'm going to just talk about in more detail. So there was a qualitative study which aimed to build understanding of the impact of uh, CFSME and then what actions people in that study said were needed in order to address that impact. And so we looked at a purposive sample of people living with it, a whole range of symptoms. We made great efforts to uh, make contact with uh, less advantaged socio-economic groups in which, uh, and also with men, where the, these, these are groups where um, the stigma of CFSME was that much more marked. So we had to make particular efforts to actually get to those groups um, and including um, ethnic minorities. So we carried out a number of interviews and focus group and what we found very clearly articulated was the need for support, to be supported as opposed to being completely not supported and even not supported within one's own family, and to actually get personalised, proactive and sustained report, uh, support in order to try to counteract the fluctuating and complex nature of living with, the, uh, li living with this condition. And so the kinds of findings that, that uh, we were looking at gave examples of wanting and also sometimes achieving uh, partnership with health practitioners in being listened to in gaining diagnosis. And people reporting these very frustrating experiences where they say, I'm the doctor, I know best, and they're not even listening to you. Um, that's frustrating. And then being able to get this diversity in treatment, so getting away from the standardised in order to have much more person-centred treatment. And then again, the actual access to practical support to manage life. And the degree of stress on the carers, as well as the, uh, uh, the people themselves, the knock-on impact on family life was something very, uh, um, that, that came through. So 
Um, this particular example, my husband's been ill at the time. Sure, it's just the stress. He's got no work. We get no social help or disabled badges or anything. So that tie-up between having these conditions, very difficult to cope with, but not being able to get belief and support from the gatekeepers to go through into getting some of the other benefits which might have actually helped with the practicalities. Further impacts being financial support, so barriers in getting benefits. And w since this time, we, we were reporting this in 2010. Well, the final report where we, where we had a big consensus event, uh, we had people in from the Department of Health who were about to bring in the new regulations overseen by ATOS. And the place was in uproar. Well, that was where anybody had energy to actually be uproar. But it was a really, the, the fear in the room, the anger in the room at what was to happen. And then, you know, since then, the, 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 the vindication of that fear and anger um, is just something which um, will stay with me all my life. And <coughs> in terms of getting to, uh, getting to work, this, this conflict between, on the one hand, feeling that people had to conceal their symptoms, but of course if they concealed the symptoms or they concealed their illness or they tried to then push through, that would then have worse knock-on effects in terms of whether they were able to um, continue to rehabilitate, continue to function and actually be able to stay in work. So, so the, the, the strategies for having some kind of equity in access to health and social care, again emphasised responsiveness, the need for flexibility and the need for more research, better training, more public information on CFSME. You know, this idea that if there could be some understanding, but of course this was a real challenge, that um, there might then be some form of, of uh, proper meaningful support. So that came through really clearly and we were able through that collaboration both to have the themes that were coming out um, very much <coughs> validated by the people that we were working with, but also for them to feel validated. So one of the things that we felt we really had to do through that, uh, throughout the whole of that research process, and part of this was, was, I think, having very motivated academics on that who wanted to do this collaboration and do this listening, to, uh, to then be able to validate what the tensions were between what supported um, uh, people uh, live it, living with a condition in terms of um, improving quality of life, getting access to the service they needed, getting the sort of understanding, um, contradicted by the very poor understandings of disease, um, the ways in which um, stigma, s stigmatizing processes interacted with other kinds of, 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 of issues like age and gender stereotypes and ethnicity. And also, um, the impact on a simple sense of citizenship and um, entitlement. So those were very important messages, and, and they, they, we were able to triangulate those um, across the whole um, study. And so if we think about those elements of, of, of research, um, what kinds of things, how far were they able to be participative? So the research partners, I mean, this was a user-led and I would definitely say purposeful alliance of academics and community members. But we were also very aware throughout the process. I mean, I, we personally had to deal with a number of very, very challenging situations and confrontations over the period that we were, we were carrying out this research because the CFS community is not one community. So while we would be validated, if you like, by one, one group of people or some groups of people, there were other groups of people who were very unhappy were undertaking any kind of social recognition research at all. And I can you know, talk about that at the end if, 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 if people have, uh, um, you know, have questions about it. Um, because part of this was about establishing what, what's the objective evidence and also what's the subjective evidence, what's our voice, we therefore had a program which had different designs for different purposes. So... Um, this is a group which very much wanted um, medical evidence building. They wanted an epidemiological study. They wanted a medically based study which, which looked at functional effects, which actually looked at, at um, uh, quality of life. But they also wanted studies which 
validated, which, which explored experience and um, produced voice and experience-based knowledge in order to seek out uh, what the range of experiences were. So the data collection was, was uh, very multifarious across the different studies. Uh, everything from um, very objective and protocol-driven examination of medical, uh, medical records, um, conventional systematic reviews, um, semi-structured interviews, focus groups, and, and video recording. So we had a, a really big panoply of different sorts of methods that we were using. And so the data analysis, again, ranged from everything from statistical to thematic analysis. But the findings of all the studies we took back to the reference group and to consensus events. And in terms of the outputs, and I've just realised I've forgotten to paste in about the outputs, but just to underline the, uh, um, the, the, the point that I was making, that again, we needed to make sure we went across the whole range of um, academic peer review journals through to um, accessible events and, and using the website. Uh, but for, and this is early days before um, th there's a current requirement about um, open access publishing. Um, we were very keen that all of the, all of the peer reviewed public publications uh, would be um, open access. And I think I won't repeat this because I realise that time is ticking. And I think maybe to underline that um, the, the, the participation meant that we were clear about the purposes, that we agreed the purposes, that these would actually include working with both objective and subjective types of evidence. But what was very interesting because of that, we were able to triangulate the findings in different ways through the partners and across the multiple studies. And we also had to recognise and address the contended positions being taken by different groups of people living with CFSME. So that was one set of, um, of issues where we were able to work directly in collaboration in developing the research, taking the methods forwards and executing the research um, with a community. Now this is a very different one. And this is when um, we were commissioned to evaluate uh, the prostitution um, strategy that was put in place as a multi-agency strategy following the murders of five prostitutes in Ipswich in 2006. And we did it over five years. There was, it was a two-part study, um, each, each one being longitudinal and um, evaluating outcomes of the strategies for objectives and their cost effectiveness. So that was tackling the demand for prostitution, developing routes out of it, looking at the initiatives that were being taken uh, across a whole range of, of, of agencies, um, undertaking prevention activities and um, um, developing community intelligence. And the design was basically nested longitudinal case study designs in which uh, a range of other kinds of data were embedded. And um, some, of the, some of the issues that um, we need to take account in, in, in terms of the research context were that, um, and, and these, these came up continually as issues raised both in the media and um, by communities themselves as this research uh, went forward, which is, oh, well, if you deal with it here, is it, so, is it simply going to be displaced? Um, protect, protective legislation um, didn't seem to have worked because, in fact, the, uh, um, the murders uh, took place over uh, just a fortnight um, where there was just rampant behaviour on, on the, uh, uh, the, 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 the part of the murderer. And um, um, there was plenty of, of um, advocacy of welfare and rights approaches to sex work, which had been patchily taken into account previously. And the Home Office suggested a combined strategy of prevention, deterrence and support. And the kinds of approach that was actually taken up in Ipswich um, was very much one which drew on all of this to um, um, provide linked interventions under each of those four headings advocated 
um, by the study in, in, uh, by Wester, uh, Hester and Westmoreland. And there were many, so it has to be said, there were many, and in some cases quite dramatic successes um, in, in the strategy. Um, so we looked at tackling demand, we examined uh, um, arrest rates, changes in police practice, and we interviewed the women police <coughs> officers who worked intensively with the sex working groups in, in, um, in, in Ipswich. Um, in order to examine developing routes out, we carried out interviews and before and after checklists with the women and also with the uh, Make a Change team professionals who were delivering the core supportive intervention. Um, in order to look at prevention, we looked at developing um, uh, what was happening to develop multi-agency practice in identifying children and young people at risk of sexual exploitation. And boy, has that really come into the news in the last year or so. And um, in terms of community intelligence, carrying out participant observation at strategy group public meetings, uh, residence briefings and interviews with community representatives. So the, the, the high intensity police activity led to um, a, a dramatic reduction in arrests and there have not been, it went from 128 in 2007 to 14 in 2008, there have been none since. I mean, I, 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 we did a dissemination event um, a few weeks ago and there are still no, uh, no arrests for curb crawling. So in terms of, if you like, the, the, the PR, the surface of it, um, that was extremely successful. And um, in terms of developing routes out, um, we certainly found over that time, because some people we followed for over four years, um, and um, the intensive study found problems reduced by help with, and it was this multi-agency approach to support with family, finance, housing, health, drug, alcohol use. And there was probably not enough resources, but there were certainly resources which made a difference. And I'll just say something very briefly about that. Um, prevention was almost not there when we started looking at this in, in um, uh, when we had our first interim report in, in, in 2008. But many more um, children and young people were now identified as being at risk. When we started, there were five children or young people who were on the at-risk register. And um, by the time we finished, they were well into the 200s. And we also did a trawl of records which looked at, at coercive networks, just starting with all the people who the team was working with. There were 850 people on, on, our, on the coercive network that we plotted. You know, let no one say that this thing just happens in certain um, ethnic groups in towns in the northwest. You go into any town, and th anyone who is, at, you know, anybody who is, is uh, um, in that same combination of vulnerabilities will be at risk in some way. And then the, the, the coercive networks, the basics of it, um, the ingredients, certainly appeared to be uh, um, you know, there and um, uh, resonating. And in terms of, of, of community inten intelligence, local people were well engaged in the strategy. Um, in fact, they, they, we did not get a sense that they felt that any of their demands, uh, you know, largely, were, were not at least um, listened to and addressed in, in some way. Um, but uh, we certainly got the message that uh, they wanted police activity sustained so that sex work demand wouldn't reappear. And um, I think I'm going to just pick out two or three points from, from, from the remaining slides on this. So, something that very much resonated in our relationship with um, people in, 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 in Ipswich and Suffolk um, was the Corson report referred to the Ipswich um, murder victims <coughs> as focusing public attention on these women as women first and foremost, someone's daughter, mother, girlfriend, and then as victims exploited by men, damaged by abuse and by drug addiction. And the Corson report said these are among the women whom society must support and help to establish, establish themselves in the community. And that was a very marked 
feature of, of, of this work. So, for, so our, our case studies um, very much brought out and, and um, articulated the damages that had been done in these women's lives as they, as they came into sex working and then as they were held in the situation that they found themselves in. And in order to, to move people away from it meant very, very responsive services, needing to have very responsive services, fast-tracking immediate needs, high-quality experiences. So the kinds of examples that we were tol told about were the importance of support workers where people felt that they did care, that they would go the extra mile, um, providing a bus pass, a towel, enhancing the sense somebody cares to get that sort of hope that you can change so you know you can do it. Um, need for long-term support. This was not something that could be solved in a few weeks. By the time we, we, we finished working with this group, um, it was not a, a, a case that everything had been solved. It was, it was all slow work. And the, acti the activity um, was partly about actually building meaningful a meaningful lives for women that was an alternative because if they were simply taken away, taken out of, moved out without any other kind of support or relationships, they were losing the relationships that were meaningful to them up till that particular point. So that, that had to be, um, meaning had to be rebuilt as well. And so I think a, a key lesson was for us, but also the agencies working with them and also the wider public to um, understand the issues likely to affect vulnerable um, children and young people, identifying coercive networks, intervening promptly and learning from what had happened to the women that actually set them on, on the path to prostitution. And I think the main, the main lesson for us from, from the report was about the central importance of coordinating. So coordinating the agencies, but also making sure that there's coordination between community concerns, community energies, and what the official agencies were likely to be doing to develop shared understandings towards pros prostitution. So what were the participative components here? Again, we had the ingredients for a strong alliance of agencies, community members and local groups with, independent, with the independent research team. Um, we also had some very rich materials available to us through the case studies, community observation, agency records and a critical documentary analysis. What had led up to this, what the strategy consisted of, how it was recorded, how it appeared in the media. Um, we carried out, again, a range of different kinds of data collection and data analysis in which, by focusing on case studies, we were able to triangulate multiple accounts of the development of each case in the context of a record of community prioritised changes. So what was happening in that strategy were components that people in the community themselves had said were important and that we also learned from the women themselves that they said were important and to bring that together as well as having a statistical and economic analysis in which we showed that for every two pounds spent on the no every one pound spent on the strategy they saved two pounds in the wider system so even though this was quite different it was very intensive it was definitely different to what had happened before, it also saved money. And then in terms of outputs, I mean, this is certainly the, the sort of the highest profile. When, whenever I do anything to do with this, I spend quite a lot of time on the media, on television, and, and also, I think very importantly, in debates with community members, with people having different views and ideas about what should be happening here, and also with... Um, the, the, the organisations that work with and for um, sex workers themselves and national policy makers. So it, it's something in which it's possible to have um, very public and very um, engaged discussion with the relevant people. I'm just going to wise this up really quickly. But 
there was a special case here. The, the shock of the murders actually created a particular window of collaborative opportunity. First, and, and there was unusually broad community support for strategy aims and willingness to support... Po yeah, they wanted a partnership, they wanted to work together, and they wanted to make sure that it would work. People were willing to mutually recognise local community needs as opposed to simply have standoffs about what should be done. Right? And the other thing which was very marked was the respectful recognition of, of sex workers' life stories, which we tried to echo in the work that we did on, on case, um, case uh, stories, case narratives. And uh, the longitudinal evaluation method again, help to present women in the context of community concerns. So these were, as the Corson report had envisaged, um, making a possibility of recognising women as women and as members of their community for whom the community would feel responsible. So the community connections meant the dissemination of findings could be debated and presented with women themselves and their advocates. And my final one, I think I'm going to have to leave because I think I've run out of time and I'm going to slow straight to my last... Um, um, no, I'll just, I'll just jump in to say this is, this is what doing action research in a hospital can entail. <laughs> this, is a, this is a relatively small project. The complexity of collaboration and, in a way, the suffocation of action within that context, we learnt an awful lot from. It, it meant that we had to be very modest in, in how, we, how we moved forward and in managing expectations. So, And so the lessons which you will now not learn except if, um, unless you were able to access this on the, uh, um, on, on the system were that in that environment we did manage to carry out action research. We had a very strong um, patient and, and um, uh, public um, involvement representative who co-researched, who developed the research and co-researched with us all the way through. We had great buy-in from all of the partners and the action research design that we adopted helped researchers encourage change by representing persistent issues over a series of cycles of action research but what we found was participants need power if they're going to cross the usual boundaries and so if, if we'd had a few more action research cycles a lot of that would have been about how do we actually um, tap the power that people need in order to cross those boundaries. So it raised challenges to learn to create new partnerships and actions, but here the action was all focused in one unit location in a complex organisation which persistently, actively reproduced its boundaries. So we had some hard, frustrating lessons to learn by the end of that project. So what would I say can enable participated researching in health research? So there is a trend to, to um, um, increase commitment. Uh, you know, people are definitely, we're definitely seeing and people are definitely wanting more inclusive and accountable research. And that's in terms of the, uh, the, the, the topics being, being studied, uh, the methods adopted and the outputs. And hopefully just those two examples that I've shown have um, indicated some of the kind of resonance and some of the, um, the potential that can be raised in um, addressing and looking very specifically at, at, at choices of those. Um, that shared understandings by researchers and the public on what participation in research can achieve is very important, that there has to be that sharing if there's going to be um, a, a collaboration uh, around enabling participation in research to happen. And identifying, uh, this, was the, this was the really important bit, was identifying what specific and diversifying processes and resources 
for participation are possible in each case needs to be done. It can't be the standard protocol. It can't be something that's set in advance. It needs to be set actively and responsibly. And then, having realised what resources are available and what changes are needed by deploying those resources, um, then setting about negotiating the changes needed to enable participative actions. So, I think I would underline that participation, participative research, and this PPI that's, that's sought by, by the uh, Changing Climate of Health research, are not static goods. They are not um, formulaic actions. They are change processes that take resources and that take purposeful, collaborative work with those resources. And I think you know, the two examples that I gave, um, I think, really underlined the, the, the momentum given by the sharing and by the urgency of purposes in both of those instances. And some of that work um, with those resources is about identifying what diverse resources and activities and sub-studies could be introduced into the research environment and that will have specific relevance in a study setting, which can actually include health services research. I mean, something that I, that I could have done, I could have actually given some examples of embedding participation in trials research. And in fact, Brenda and I are collaborating on just such, a, just such an instance at the moment. But I, 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 I wanted to uh, um, take those, uh, those ones for, 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 for other reasons. And then to, to underline that just because you have a policy about participation, just because you have a policy for PPI, um, or, or indeed, just because you have health research and the usual types of research don't appear to lend themselves to participation does not mean to say that, th that participation is either automatically given nor automatically excluded because active negotiation and embedding can make it happen. And that's about being the active and, and um, very collaborative uh, research it using what comes to hand and one has to have a hard look at what comes to hand and how it can come to hand. And I have some references and I would like to say many thanks to everybody who helped make the research possible and to you for your time and attention. can participative research emerge from non-participative settings? And I think you've answered that question, yes it can. And I think you've also answered it from, it isn't a formulaic approach, public involvement, uh, there's different ways and for each project mm. it will look differently. And at the beginning of your talk you mentioned involve, and again you've got a national guidance on good practice for involving uh, the public um, and uh, community engagement. And here in the North West, we've got the North West People in Research Forum, which is there to assist um, people in designing projects and good practice. But as you've said, um, there's no one set template, and um, it varies between consultation, collaboration, co-investigation, and, and co-production. I'm going to open up the floor to any questions for Fiona. I was thinking back particularly to this first project and then you said there were very different camps and, and different um, views um, at the beginning of the project. And then we were sort of looking at the shared outputs at the end. And I was thinking, I was wondering how with those very, very different um, viewpoints at the beginning you reached a consensus um, of outputs at the end. There is, there is mm, indeed, what, what one says about consensus. Um, I said well, we had a consensus event, but I did not say that we achieved universal consensus. Right. So, so um, and, and that was also why my almost last point was the one about um, acknowledging difference. I think if, if, if you cannot agree, and there is absolutely no way under the sun that um, at, at the moment um, you know, some, some of those camps um, can possibly agree, 
what one can do is to manage those differences as respectfully as possible and to, um, you know, to, to refer to those differences, but also to um, involve those people who do wish to, um, you know, to relate to and to um, um, discuss ways in which the outputs of research uh, may have a use. But there was certainly a, a, you know, another group of people that said the research was a complete waste of time and that that money, we, we actually had the largest, at that time, it was the largest big lottery funded medical research grant um, to, you know, to, to, to date. And um, uh, we, we had a, a lot of uh, very angry messages to say that the money had been completely wasted on the, the, uh, the, the set of outputs and that should have gone to biomedical research which would look at the my biomedical causes and treatments of um, um, CFSME. And, and, and I can fully understand, uh, you know, the, the, the anger and I can fully understand, you know, the, the, um, uh, you know, the passion to try to solve what is a very intractable um, problem in the face of often very... Uh, um, very difficult interactions with family, health professionals, and you know, welfare professionals. To what extent can you remain detached from the object of your work? Sorry? To what extent can you remain detached from what a process that I understand, in my very simplistic way, to be a very engaged? process by the researcher that's that again is quite a comp that, 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 that's quite a complicated one because um, depending on the stance you know depending on what sort of social science researcher I want to be in a particular project um, I would not want to be detached mm -hmm. right that's not to say I would want to be random and um, unsystematic about how I go about my work but uh, you know, for, for, for much of what I do, um, I need to, to actually be immersed. Right. However, one has to have, I think, times when one becomes detached, uh, when one is reflexive, uh, reflective, um, also to, you know, to, to, to take account of the context in which you're working. So, um, you know, like the one about will everybody um, agree with me? Should everybody agree with me or... Um, this particular group, what is the nature of disagreement. So to, to that extent, you cannot simply be wedded to your own values, your own preferences, your own findings. Uh, and, and I would say it's a kind of a dynamic process that I manage over time, because I have to help other people um, engage in that process as well. I have to be able to exemplify it. I have to... Um, also you know, manage the kinds of, 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 of emotions that come up. And, and then, if you like, be the academic about those. Where do those come from? You know, why do they mean? What do I do with them next? Is that halfway to an answer? Um, that's a difficult question. No. Uh, well, let me, well, I'll tell you what. Let me, let me just go, go, go with being um, um, the objective academic, right? The other thing that I, that I, that I picked out of, of um, probably both, both of the projects that I talked about was there are, even when you want to kind of be on somebody's side, there is a demand, there is an, an, a need for objective information. Now, if I'm going to facilitate that, then I have to take on the role and adopt the practices of objectivity. Right? So, so there, is a, there is a time for that. And uh, you know, there, there is an express need for that, even when you're doing collaborative research, which in which you sort of need to recognise when, when you produce that. And in that case, um, you would do trials-type research, you would follow a protocol, you would be publishing that, that protocol as early as possible in advance, so that you would then be accountable for the rest of that research process in terms of, have you done the thing that you said you were going to do and not been biased in the rest of the research process. So if you're going to go down that route to produce a particular type of evidence, then you need to do those behaviours and adopt those kinds of stances. Right. Yes, sorry. Um, 
I wonder, did you ever find your participants had unrealistic expectations about what research could produce for them? Absolutely. And but, how do you handle that? But, but, who, am I, but who, who am I to say, you know, what, 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 what people should wish? So I think that, um, yes, if I, if I just, for all of those, um, I needed, to, one, one, one has a challenge to find out what the kinds of research processes that people are expecting and then to try to be as um, a transparent and b as accountable as possible as to what you can actually do so there is an issue about you know what what can this research process do well if it if it lasts for three years or if it lasts for two years it can't do the same as one that would last five years or ten years if it's focused in one one small place then it may not be able to be just simply um, you know, generalisable to uh, a, a much wider area. So I think one has to be very clear and not to overclaim what it is that one says is going to um, um, come out of the research at the end um, or you know, the actions that can take place. And, and had, I, had I had a chance to talk about the action research um, you know, process, where in a way you're promising you know, you will be really involved in this. That, that, will, that will enable, you know, really practice relevant changes. Ah, but only up to a point. And it's, it's actually making that apparent and, and, uh, and, and having to find ways of dealing with both the disappointment, but also focusing on what can be got out of what it is that one can produce. Thank you for a really interesting, insightful talk. Anyway... I'm interested in community, and I always mm. find that there's a lot of P words associated with community. Um, public policy, partnership, participant. I mean, it goes on. The one I'm really interested in, you came to, although it was intrinsic throughout the whole talk, in the last slide, you talked about power. You know, there were P words. And I'm just interested in terms of, isn't participation about how the relations of power change within the process? Another P word. Ab ab absolutely, and, 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 and in a way, I suppose running running through, and as you say, Im 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 implicit, were were kind of all little ingredients of power, yeah. yeah. And um, and so so part of the specifics of working with any within any project is to identify what are the what are the ingredients of power, who can hold them, and who can exercise them. And then how can one actually encourage perhaps some shift if a particular change is needed to understand the shifts that need to happen, the shifts in power that need to happen, but then what the components are within that situation to enable that shift. And that's a highly skilled exercise and enterprise. And I think but, but, it, but it's got that, and that's why it so needs not to be written in policies that are nowhere near the place where you are at the time. And if the place where you are is a, res a research project with particular resources, with a particular brief, working in a particular place with particular people, with expectations and um, you know, with their own concerns and resources, then part of one's inventory of what one has to, to uh, address in terms of, of uh, power is, is actually being very, very hard-nosed, very realistic about what, what there is and then to treat it and hence the process and hence the negotiation of then saying this will be a job of work I don't know how far I can go with it but we will find out and that's part that needs to be an intrinsic part of, of the uh, research process. One more question, to some extent you've answered it already but my question was really around you know the, the distinction between participat and participative research, action research user-controlled research, mm -hmm. co-production, and you know, where you place yourself in all that, how you shape it to be for good, as it were. Right. So, I mean, I, I suppose what, I, what I've said is I've, I've, I've talked about a very messy and partial um, picture of participation, right? And I've also talked about... Um, you know, there, there being different kinds of, of tensions and, um, uh, you know, possibly unintended um, consequences of, of, uh, um, of, of participation. 
And, and I just think that the responsible, the responsible researcher who's interested in promoting participation you know, needs to be um, very open about those and to be able to actually have honest, honest dialogue about what is going on. And that is part of the joint learning that can then take place. And that in itself constitutes the participation. So it may not look like a lovely, neat, participative um, process in itself. But can I make elements of that participation happen and for those to be worthwhile? Right? So I think you, you could have good and bad participation and it's up to you and it's up to, to select the values which you then try to enact. But you don't even necessarily know how to do that until you're actually working in, in the situation. You don't know what's good or you, know, you don't know what's going to be good or bad for people in this situation until you're actually working with that process of processes and in that place. I'm mindful that we are putting you through your paces and mm -hmm. there's plenty of opportunity after this uh, session to, to ask questions of Fiona. But what you really demonstrated here is well one, funders are expecting public involvement and engagement. You won't get funded unless you've mm. done it right from day one in the development of the research protocols um, all, all the way through the bids. And I think what you've also <coughs> illustrated is the resources involved mm. in mm. truly using proper public involvement engagement, mm. not just financial resources, but time, expertise and people. Mm. And it's like a project within a project and it fits very well into the MRC framework for complex interventions. And yes, you will have maybe an RCT, you will have observation studies, but all the way through, you'll mm -hmm. have public involvement and public engagement. And, and if you just try, if, if all you do is to tick the boxes, as far as I'm concerned, you, you, you're denying yourself and you're denying everybody in your team and you're denying the public that is, uh, uh, you know, waiting to see what emerges from the research, you know, something, you know, real, uh, of real genuine value that, uh, you know, needs to be built in. It's mm. making it authentic. It is, and, um, yeah. But uh, what I'd like to do is say thank you very much to Fiona for an excellent presentation and then also to advertise and promote the next I4P uh, workshop, which is on the 26th of November, which is Wednesday next week, and that is looking at breaking out the temples of culture, exploring arts, health and well-being initiatives in the community. So again, more community work, more participation work, but uh, following uh, an Arts for Health thread, which I know is of interest to yourself, Fiona. But um, I'd just like to say thank you very much on behalf of the Faculty of Health and Social Care, I4P. Thanks very much indeed, Fiona. Well, thank you very much.